Hi everyone. Welcome back to OILS 513. This is the third learning module in our course and this week we'll be discussing the information life cycle which is a grand unifying theory within the field of information science. Now the information life cycle is a conceptual framework that we use to identify and describe each major stage of life that an information object moves through during its useful period of existence within an organization. Now an important concept in the life cycle theory is that the value that we assign to information objects changes radically over the course of that uh, piece of information's lifespan. Typically information has a very high initial value to it that tapers off to almost nothing by the end of its life. The, con the life cycle concept also implies that there are discernible stages of change within the existence of any piece of information. So there's a point of creation, there's a point where it's it's distributed, there's a point where it's actively used, where it might be modified, then where it's saved or it's discarded. Now you'll hear another similar term called the Information Lifecycle Management or ILM and that's used by the technology industries and really there's a difference between information life cycle theory that we're talking about now and information life cycle management. Life cycle management or ILM is typically used by software companies to show how their software or hardware can be implemented in an organization to solve a particular information need. So how does company X's software product or hardware system or data storage system, how does it solve one of the major stages of uh, the information life cycle within a particular information producing organization? Now in, in terms of information life cycle theory, what we're talking about is a more general uh, academic concept of understanding how information is produced and flows through an organization and how its usefulness changes over time but it's not necessarily tied to a particular technology solution. So life cycle theory is a general description of how information lives and dies. Life cycle management is the technology application of life cycle theory. Now that being said, uh, just a little tiny bit of history. Uh, life cycle concept was originally developed by IBM in the 1950s and during that era of mainframe computing it was really intended to show how a large company or organization, say like an insurance company, that needs a very large scale mainframe type of uh, computing system back then, um, how IBM would design and implement that mainframe system uh, to meet all of that insurance company's needs. Uh, during the 70s and the 80s, when smaller computers, uh, you know, in terms of hardware became available and software became more important than uh, hardware for a computing system, the, the emphasis on the life cycle model shifted to a software development orientation. So uh, today, while you will see a uh, a lot of different variations on this term, but uh, you'll see frequently the idea of the software development life cycle, SDLC, that's used by uh, many companies to describe how they design and produce uh, software products. The other area that of the commercial world that influenced uh, 
uh, information life cycle theory was in the area of product development. And most notably, the automotive industry in the 1980s really defined what is called product life cycle management or a unified system, a unified worldview of how uh, products are designed, manufactured, and then sold to the public, and then they go under review and they get redesigned, and a new and better product is sold. The automotive industry systematized their view of how they develop products to increase their efficiency as companies. Um, this view of inform and information as a product sort of really has infiltrated the idea uh, in terms of academic research of the information life cycle theory as many companies uh, in this day and age uh, do produce information as a product. So really, in terms of history, there are, are two parents to contemporary information life cycle theory. One is from the product development side in a large scale industry, and the other is from the systems development side in the technology industries. Here are some of the characteristics of an information life cycle that we can use to identify uh, how the life cycle operates. So it is, of course, a conceptual framework. Uh, it abstracts the how information is produced and flows through an organization. Uh, it's also meant to be descriptive. It means to uh, fully describe the, each stage of life of a, an information object, and that's we'll find later in the lecture, that's one of its more valuable uh, features when we apply the life cycle model to an organization, is its descriptive power uh, that helps us understand how information is produced and used. It's of course modular, meaning each stage in the life cycle can be readily identified as a separate unit. Scalability is important. Um, the information life cycle model can be used to describe how one person in an office works, or how a department operates, or how a whole organization operates in terms of how they produce and use and distribute and save the information that they find valuable. And then it can be adaptable. Um, it can be adapted to many different perspectives, as we'll see in a slide that's coming up shortly. Uh, there's many different uses for the life cycle model. As I mentioned, the idea of value as it is assigned to information is very important to the uh, life cycle theory. Now, within any organization, people assign a particular value to an information object, and that value changes over time. The type of value that we assign to objects really depends on the type of organization and the type of information. So, for example, in a pharmaceutical company where its raw research data um, is extremely financially important to the success of the company, we call that you know, type of financial value. Uh, we find in, in other types of large-scale organizations like governmental organizations um, that information has more of an operational or a problem-solving or a task-oriented value. Information helps organizations get their mission accomplished. It helps them get things done. And then in other types of organizations, uh, schools, colleges, museums, archives, libraries, 
historical societies. Information how is a value in and of itself that doesn't necessarily have a financial value, although a lot of historical and cultural information uh, does have a financial value, but it not doesn't necessarily ha have to uh, have that. Um, there's a certain you know, financial value to educational information, but primarily educational information has its intrinsic value. It's valuable in and of itself um, without any other uh, impeding features. As I mentioned, value of information changes throughout its lifespan, and that's really where the life cycle model has its uh, great utility is charting how that value changes. So typically we find that information that is has just been created has a high perceived value and that value drops off almost immediately over time as the information uh, becomes obsolete and unless that information is refreshed or updated the uh, information will rapidly move into a period where it's either going to become disused or discarded uh, if it's not refreshed in terms of its value. The information life cycle of an organization is actually a whole series of stacked or layered uh, life cycle models and each life cycle model has a different perspective or a different function within the organization. So it's important when you get to the assignment part of this learning module that um, you think in terms of creating your own information life cycle models uh, that are multifaceted and that describe all of the different issues in terms of how information is created and used and stored within your own organizations. So for example, one type of information life cycle could be a policy life cycle where we're concerned with the security of the information. So what stages does an information object have to go through in terms of its accessibility to people who want to use the information within an organization. Now, an organization like the Central Intelligence Agency has a very sophisticated policy information lifecycle and they have many layers of types of access controls on the information. Policy can also refer to how an organization stores information after it has lost its initial uh, value. So in many cases um, there are legal requirements, especially here in the United States, that organizations need to adhere to with, in terms of record keeping for both uh, private companies and government organizations. So these organizations have to create records management departments and they have to be, have uh, a lot of concern about how long company records and information objects are being retained. Another type of life cycle deals with the format that the information is produced and used in. Uh, this can be both physical and digital in nature, but um, for example, uh, a company that that uh, publishes technical reports probably uses word processing software like Microsoft Word to create their documents and then they have to reformat them into say PDFs or uh, ebook formats for publishing and distribution of their, their information. So how uh, piece of information is formatted electronically or physically through its lifespan is a format type of life cycle. And of course, as I, we just talked about a moment ago, um, 
technology-based systems that support information work within an organization have their own uh, individual life cycles uh, dealing with how information moves through, say, a large information processing system or how information is stored on various um, hardware devices throughout an organization during its lifespan. So you can see that there isn't just one consideration in developing an information life cycle. We have to consider all the different um, components that are necessary to support the creation and use of information in an organization. And each one of these different components has its own unique life cycle design. Now this is a very basic, probably the most minimalistic model of what an information life cycle looks like. And this was designed by the Joint Information Systems Committee, which is a, a government agency in Great Britain. And really in Western Europe and the United Kingdom, those countries in the last 10 years or so have done quite a bit on a national, their own national bases uh, for developing coherent information standards that are used throughout their uh, individual countries. JISC is probably one of the best examples of a, a really stellar uh, information standards organization. And you're actually going to be reading um, their introductory document to uh, information life cycles uh, during the assignment part of this learning module. But as a minimum, the JISC has defined these four steps as being uh, the most foundational steps in an information life cycle. Now at the end of the lecture we will look at a number of different other examples of fully developed information life cycles that are used by a variety of different organizations. And you'll see that they have, those life cycles have many more steps and many more layers um, included in them. But these four steps are a great place for us to begin our initial analysis of a life cycle model within an organization. The first step, creation. Creation doesn't simply deal with how an information object like an email is created mainly by typing on a keyboard, but what are the processes that go into the creation of that information? Is it through research? Is it through organizational activities? Is it through um, a workflow process? How exactly is an information object like an email or an internal memoranda or a report created within an organization? So this can be creation phase can be broken into many different other sub-phases, including sort of like research, investigation, um, reaction to a problem, etc. Active use assumes that the information that was created in the previous stage has been formatted and distributed to an audience of users who will find it valuable. So there's a, a, a lot that's implied in the shifting from creation to active use. And here are some of the issues that need to be um, dealt with during an information object's active use. Um, some of those involve who has access to the information, who is allowed to see and use the information. Others involve who has the authority to modify the information. 
and then finally, who has the authority to say that the information is no longer uh, it's in its most valuable state or most current state? Who can say that the information is now outdated or obsolete? Those are some of the considerations uh, that all information is um, subject to during its active use phase. And when we, when information starts aging out, starts becoming obsolete, um, there are two things that happen to it. If the information is important for the uh, for ongoing use, uh, information that becomes obsolete needs to be refreshed or updated so that it maintains its level of activity and active value within an organization. However, most information objects um, tend to start to age out very quickly. And in the little graph here, this graph is taken um, from the field of bibliometrics, which is a subfield of information science. And bibliometrics studies how scholarly information is used after it's published. And there's sort of a universal law here, and which involves this long tail on the graph, um, that it has been found that scholarly articles in academic journals tend to be very highly read and dis disseminated uh, immediately after they're published, but then they tend not to be reused later on. And so most academic articles, um, to the chagrin of their authors, uh, immediately move into the semi-active use phase where they, they really don't have that much value anymore after their initial publication. We find that in most types of information that's produced by any type of organization, um, that information objects have a very high active value and active use when they're first created and then they almost immediately move into a semi-active use phase. An ex another example might be the syllabus for this course. I'm sure that when you all started the course in the first week, you read the syllabus, it had a high active use at that point, and you, had, you would assign it at that point a high value. But probably now, by the third week of the course, the syllabus is probably losing its value for you, um, as you've disseminated. You know, you've already um, absorbed the information uh, that's in it, and you, unless you need to go back to refer to it, um, it's probably going to diminish in use very rapidly over the next couple of weeks. Another good example of how um, information objects move into active use is uh, semi-active use um, is in the area of websites. Um, we all find that if you're looking for a particular piece of information on the web, you're always looking for the website that has the most current information and that in you know, websites, you find that um, they are still live, but um, the, uh, it's obvious from the last updated tags on the articles on the websites that um, it's been a while since anybody has refreshed the information on that site. Um, you'll always go return to the websites that are very actively updated and probably not return to the ones that aren't updated very often. The final outcome stage is where we have to decide whether information needs to be stored or it needs to be destroyed or it needs to be transformed into some other kind of information. Those are really the three options. Um, 
when the information stops being used actively, uh, an organization has to determine, maybe as a matter of policy, that it needs to be retained for a period uh, and retained in case of legal issues or because of um, requirements for ongoing customer access to that information. Most organizations will attempt to uh, simply discard information that it no longer finds useful, but there are a number of barriers, um, the one being legal requirements. Another is that um, a lot of organizations find that there is some historical value in keeping uh, information around. But the final outcome stage is where this decision is made to either take the information objects out of the current life cycle in which they, if they're going to be retained uh, long term, they actually enter another long term storage information life cycle and they become transformed from being the information objects in the current life cycle to being members of another life cycle. Um, or the information can be completely deprecated from the organization, uh, deleted uh, as having no value in terms of retention, or it can be recycled back into the current or into another uh, life cycle where it takes on another purpose in life and has another um, life cycle that it uh, becomes a member of. Now here, for example, since I mentioned records retention, uh, this life cycle model is a very basic one that was created by the Association of Record Managers, or ARMA, um, to show how information objects that belong to a large organization that aren't deemed useful to the main life cycle model of that organization are transferred into a records management life cycle where the records are created or where they enter into the records management life cycle and then they are maintained for however long the company's policies require and then they're disposed of in one form or another. Uh, this is a more fully developed records management model that shows uh, sort of both the core information life cycle in a large organization and adds the, towards the end here, maintenance, protection, and disposition, um, the records management functions. And you can see between the two that there are added steps in the life cycle process and that in any life cycle model, there's more than just the four basic stages that are outlined in the JISC uh, documentation that you're going to be reading. Now, sort of what good is the information life cycle model uh, for us as members of our own uh, work and um, school organizations? Uh, what can we use that information lifecycle model for? And we find that there's a number of really good reasons within an organization to use the lifecycle model uh, to both identify how information is used within the organization and also how to uh, plan for new services or improve uh, on existing workflow processes. Uh, the life cycle model is very good for documenting how information flows through an organization. 
And you can see this, this list of examples um, are really good reasons for any organization to adopt an information lifecycle view of how it produces, uses, and saves and discards the information that makes the organization run. Sort of finish up, let's look at some examples of life cycle models in other types of organizations. And these vary gr a great deal. And some of them are not pure life cycle, information life cycle models. Um, <clears throat> but you can begin by looking at these to see how organizations adapt that simple four stage G uh, JISC uh, model to their actual organizational needs. So this is one of my favorite. Um, this is both an information life cycle model and also um, a student management model. You can see that they have, in whoever has authored this model, has intermixed pure information management stages um, of moving students into a college or university uh, through their academic programs and out uh, to become alumni. But they've mixed sort of student um, stages of development and information management within the organization, both in one life cycle model. And they've actually done it uh, relatively well here. But this is a, an excellent example of how uh, academic administrators um, can utilize the uh, life cycle model for their own purposes. This is a very special purpose life cycle model, which is the development and publication of linked open data, which the uh, linked data movement is one where we're trying to uh, develop what is called the semantic web or to create intelligent links between web resources that are online. And it in involves a complex stage of, uh, not of creating uh, additional metadata for links to, from one web page to another uh, online uh, resource that it references. Here you can see that the life cycle is not only divided into phases, but its author has identified individual information workers who participate in each phase and identified which of those workers uh, are active in each stage of the um, information uh, development and distribution of these uh, linked data resources. And of course, uh, the military is has a very sophisticated information management um, protocols, procedures, and standards of its own that rarely we, we rarely get to see in civilian life. But this is called a, law, a course of action life cycle, um, where a mission problem, a military mission problem, is being identified and courses of action are being developed by the both the planners uh, at a high level military unit level um, and also the commanders on the ground. So you can see that there are many different contexts where the information life cycle is of value to large organizations. Finally, this was actually developed by uh, the Microsoft Research Division um, <clears throat> that includes the stages of how scholarly articles are 
produced and published and disseminated. It also includes a secondary layer where uh, some technology components for the life cycle have been included in each major stage um, of the, the life cycle model. So you can see in the authoring stage that they um, are proposing the use of different add-ins for Microsoft Office software and different technology solutions for publication, storage, ar archiving, and um, research and analysis. And finally here, uh, we are going to have a whole module uh, talking about the academic research data life cycle. And <clears throat> for those of you who are uh, engaged in doing active research, uh, this will be very valuable to you as this model not only reflects the conceptual stages of how research data is collected and analyzed for a particular you know, research project, um, but it also adheres to the federal standards for data management and from planning uh, through reporting uh, that all researchers who receive federal funding are required to adhere to. So while this plan, this uh, life cycle, I mean, is really oriented towards uh, low level research data collection and processing and analysis, um, You'll see when we get to the uh, research life cycle uh, module that there are a lot of different contextual um, layers to each one of these stages um, and that researchers nowadays, because of government requirements, uh, have to take into account a lot more than simple research data collection. Um, there's a lot more documentation and, and uh, reporting requirements for researchers who receive federal funding these days than ever before. All right, so let's talk about uh, your assigned readings uh, for this week. Uh, the first one, of course, as I mentioned, is the uh, managing the information life cycle uh, it's called an info kit. It is 60 pages, but um, it, it's very easy reading, so I don't think you'll have any trouble getting through it rather quickly. Um, <clears throat> the JISC model will take you through a lot of what we already just covered in the lecture also, um, and it will show you how different types of organizations um, implement the uh, information life cycle model uh, to their benefit. Uh, the second one is a web page that includes a very sophisticated, very complex uh, data life cycle model that was developed by the British Digital Curation Center. And their life cycle model um, has to do with both it can be applied to both research data and um, digital data that is uh, used and manipulated by libraries, archives, and uh, research centers. This is a, a really good example of how um, how in depth the information life cycle can be developed uh, at its fullest level uh, for a particular uh, purpose. Now, we've talked quite a bit in the lecture about information value and this um, article by Chen and provides a really good summary of how information value changes and um, grows and decreases uh, within 
the information lifecycle model uh, in any organization. And then finally, there's a very short article that's um, it's a very good, concise introduction. I think it's only two or three pages um, by Tony Fisher about the data management life cycle. And it has applicability to both the area of research, but also more generally to any type of data, low-level data management that any large organization has to uh, maintain. And while uh, this slide um, is labeled this week's assignments, you actually have two weeks to complete them. Um, we'll have the information life cycle model is this week. Uh, next week, we'll have a learning module on business process management and workflow. And then the third week, uh, you'll have as a work week to uh, complete your assignments for uh, both the life cycle and the business process management modules. So um, you've got a good bit of time before these assignments uh, become due. I would suggest that you do the reading this week at least. Um, the assignments aren't due until sub Sunday, September 14th, and <clears throat> there are extensive instructions on the learning module overview page, um, but your main assignment is to produce a short white paper. White paper is a summary of how to solve a particular problem, but a, a short white paper defining the information lifecycle for an organization for which you have some familiarity. Now, it can be an organization you work for, it can be um, your um, participation in school, you can use the academic environment as the uh, subject of your life cycle, but really what I want you to do is to do a uh, fairly in-depth analysis of a large organization of which you're a part and define the um, information life cycle for that group. The tools and methods exercise this week is to install and use a flowchart modeling software application. There is a free um, flowchart tool that is available called DIA, D-I-A. And the links to download and use that application uh, are in the learning module overview page. If you have access to another type of flowcharting tool like uh, Microsoft Visio, however, uh, go ahead and use whatever you are familiar with or have, in, uh, have access to. Um, but the idea is to be able to create your life cycle uh, model diagram uh, using a good, uh, sophisticated flow charting tool. As I mentioned, you'll have extra time to work on the projects um, the week of uh, September 8th through the 14th. And then I would like, for this, the sake of continuing our, our interactivity between us um, uh, during the course, I'd like you to review and make a reply comment to at least three of your classmates' assignments. Um, that's due uh, by September 17th. That gives you an extra couple days after you turn in, after everyone turns in their um, white paper assignments for you all to read and review them. And if you have time, <clears throat> excuse me, if you have time, I have a number of good articles that expound upon different aspects of uh, the life cycle model that are in the further reading section. And even if you just browse over the articles um, 
and sort of scan through them. Uh, I think you'll find some benefit when you get to the part of the assignment where you're defining your own uh, life cycle model. But as always, um, I'm available by email, phone, or in my office on every Monday except today, Labor Day. Um, and so if you have any questions or have any issues with the learning module content or with using the uh, Blackboard system, please let me know. Have a good week, and I will talk to you again on next week when our learning module uh, is going to concern us with uh, business process management and workflow. Take care.